Well, we are in our second session and final session of our review of the Da Vinci Code, the novel. And we're going to talk in this session about some undisclosed codes. We'll talk a little bit, first of all, about how we did get our Bible, how we know it's the right thing, not the, the nonsense that Dan Brown has tried to foist on us. But we'll also talk about a couple of other things. We'll talk about some broader codes that Dan Brown hasn't told you about that may even be more disturbing than the ones he has in some respects. And we'll also talk about the ultimate code, the code that you and I need to unravel for ourselves. So let's get into this. So we're in the second session. We'll talk a little bit about how we got our Bible. We'll talk about the hidden code that's going on around us. And why Jesus? Why is, this, why is he the center of all this? Then we'll talk about a hidden mystery, what Brown didn't tell you, and some other surprises. How we got our Bible. You know, it's interesting to contrast the so-called Gnostic Gospels with Luke. Luke is clearly the subject of very careful investigation. He himself says so in the first chapter, but even more than that, Sir William Ramsey, an unbeliever, set out to prove that Luke's history was filled with errors. And he spent a lifetime of painstaking study in which he wrote, Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect to trustworthiness. That's his summary. And uh, he wrote a book on that subject that's available. So he, he went through all the details and verified all of them, much to his shock, and obviously became a, a very convinced supporter. And uh, it's an orderly account. The Gospels we have are an orderly account of verifiable details. The Gospels we have are designed for an intelligent decision. They're not simply collections of spe mystical speculations that uh, can't ever, never be resolved. The Gospels we have are confirmable with historical details. Cities, seas, ships, geographical minutiae have been confirmed by archaeologists all through. There's a, there's a, that's a whole, we could spend a lot of time on that. Augustine said it pretty clearly. If you believe what you like in the Gospels, and reject what you don't like. It's not the gospel you believe, but yourself. <laughs> One of the things that's very important to understand, you'll find many pastors, people who call themselves Christian, that are selective in what they accept in the Bible. Big mistake. Because you're going to discover, sooner or later, that it all ties together. And as somebody says, sort of like a knit dress, you pull it one place and the whole thing will unwind. That's really true. You, you take one thing and decide to reject it. You'll discover that there's so many things. A good example is the, uh, the creation in Genesis. Well, I don't believe in six literal days. Well, you've got a big problem, not with Genesis, but with Exodus 20, verse 11. Because God himself, with his own finger, wrote it in stone. Verse 11, chapter 20, that, that he expects us to understand it with six days. Well, that may have some problems. Check them out. And once you go through that, go through our, our, our uh, expo exposition in Genesis. And uh, you'll discover suddenly everything else gets clearer. No, you want to tie it. It's a, it's a package. It's a package. You want to be careful. The Gnostic Gospels are sort of do, do your own thing kind of things. Everybody likes that today. I, 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 you know, I have my way. You have yours. That's fine. Be careful about the popular paths. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So if you're going through a gate, and it's crowded, you got the wrong gate. You got the wrong gate. Where did the Bible come from? You know, the, Lee Teabing, the expert in the, in the story of the Vinci Code, says, The Bible is a product of man, my dear, not of God. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's not true. That's an uninformed assessment. You, I, I use this so often people make fun of me by doing it, but it's really true. 66 books penned by over 40 different guys over several thousand years. We discover it's an integrated package. You say you can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. The one reason I'm so hung up on this isn't just because you'll understand the Bible better when you discover its integrity as a whole. But more than that, you, once you understand that, you can prove it's true because it describes history before it happens. And uh, that, that no, other, no other book on the planet Earth 
can do that. And by that, you verify that Jesus Christ really is who he said he was, and he in turn then authenticates the rest of it for you. Because it had to come from outside space-time. You can prove that. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. Do your homework. And uh, it has design features that are impossible to even simulate with a computer. The, the, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the first 11 ver verses of Matthew, are very well known. But there's another one that's not as well known that's even more profound. The last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark are controversial. Some of your Bible says a little footnote, they were added later. Yeah. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Those 12 verses were expurgated by the Gnostics in Alexandria. How do I know that? Very simple. Take the mathematical properties of those verses and try to simulate them with a computer. It turns out you can have four million computers for a million years and still not accomplish it if you're going at it in terms of random variation. The sevenfold structure. It's not just seven words. That, uh, 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 seven, every number is divisible by seven exactly. The number of words, the number of letters, not just two. There's 35, in fact, 75 features that are present in those verses. A, a scribe writing in by hand centuries ago couldn't have fabricated those uh, features. And it's in Greek, which every verb has five conditions that you, you not like English, not like Hebrew, you can play games with Hebrew, it's designed that way. Even English has got a lot of flexibility. Not Greek. And it's in Greek that it has this incredible, uh, there, there's a security system that never rusts or wear out, and it's looking out for you. And uh, all of that's covered in some of our materials. We you know, learn the Bible in 24 hours. Even our survey of the Bible deals with these issues in it. If you're not familiar with them, I encourage you to dig into it. How was the canon? We, the, canon the word canon, come, the ancient word of the word canon means measuring guide, a standard. It's the standard. How was the standard Bible developed? Well, the Old Testament, it's not the problem here. It, it was pulled together about 400 B.C. in the days of Ezra. In, in, in three groups, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And Jesus himself authenticates those. He authenticates this, even this division in Luke 24, verse 44. Jesus authenticates the Old Testament many times. He quotes from each of the books of Moses and attributes it to Moses and uh, so on and so forth. That, 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 that's not an issue here in this thing. And uh, he ratifies them by frequent references as the word of God in the scriptures. So that's not a problem. The New Testament's the issue here, which is pulled together not in several thousand years like the Old Testament, but in a single lifetime during the first century, the New Testament. How did it happen? See, most of it was written while the apostles were still alive. Everything could be checked out. When Paul writes to the Corinthians about the resurrection, chapter 15, 500 people up in, in uh, Galilee that were there, some of them were still around. I love the way John Ankerberg deals with this. Is, suppose I was going to, to convince, try to convince you that John F. Kennedy was killed in Dealey Plaza with a bow and arrow. Could I fly that for you? Of course not. Why? Because there are people around that were eyewitnesses. And that's exactly the situation in, in, the, in the New Testament period. And uh, Interestingly enough, by the way, in John 14, in the upper room, Jesus Christ endorses these writings in advance. Many people miss that point. But Peter, in a second letter, presenting himself as an eyewitness, having been up at the Mount Transfiguration and all that, he says, you, you and I have something even more sure, more sure word of prophecy. The prophetic scriptures clearly validate Jesus Christ's messianic uh, position uh, in, the, in the New Testament, but also uh, the prophecy also of what happened subsequent to the very day. So how, how did the Bible come together? With letters that were received and circulated at that time, they were contemporaneously. A growing group of these letters were exchanged and copied and revered by the early church. This was going on while these guys were still alive and walking around. Peter was writing letters. John was writing letters. Paul was writing letters. And they were exchanged and revered by the early church. They weren't selected by any council. They're ratified later. But they were recognized. First of all, they had to be authoritative. The, the ones that were re, uh, revered were the ones that were apostolic. And they defined somebody that was apostolic as someone who witnessed the resurrection, was alive with them, and so forth. And uh, 
Also, the other process was they had to be in harmony with the accepted doctrine. They got very suspicious of something that was diverse or different. What's important to understand is the 27 books that you and I have as the New Testament were all accepted by the early church by the end of the first century. They are cited by church fathers in the subsequent centuries again and again and again. Every New Testament book was cited as authoritative by a church father within one generation. These other things are written centuries, not generations, centuries later. Centuries later. What were the criteria? They had to be apostolicity. They had to be apostolic. They had, to, they, had to, they had to conform with the Old Testament prophets. Couldn't violate from that. They had to conform with the New Testament. They looked, they expected, and found integrity in the Word of God. And they were continuous and wide, there was continuous and widespread acceptance. It wasn't something coming out of left field. The councils that met in subsequent times only ratified what the churches had already accepted. That's why there were councils of the bishops. They all agreed, yes, we, we accept those, etc. And so, and this was confirmed. In 175, there's a Muratorian fragment that lists the books. This is in 175. Understand this is, you know, 150 years before the Council of Nicaea. It's damaged, so it's not complete because the, the fragment we have is damaged, but 23 of the 27 are confirmed in the Muratorian fragment. And uh, there were other books that it recognized as forgeries, interestingly enough. In 325, at the Council of Nicaea, one of the things Constantine did do, he ordered 50 Bibles to be prepared on the best parchments by the best guys. He gave that uh, to, uh, to Eusebius to do. Eusebius of Caesarea was responsible for making these 50 Bibles. And his writings confirm exactly what you'd expect. That he included the 27 universally acknowledged books in his Bibles. Constantine didn't pick them. He just ordered the Bible that was broadly accepted to be copied and made available to the bishops and so forth. And uh, Eusebius was commissioned to do that, and he did do that. And uh, when you get a few years later, Athanasius um, wrote an Easter letter where he lists them also. The Council of Hippo lists them and confirms them. And 397, the Third Council of Carthage also lists them. And all this is well documented in church history, and is and the, the Dan Brown novel and his assertions are just blind to the to the confirmed history that we do have. There are three tests: biographical, we want reliable documents, citations of the early fathers to support it. There's internal tests, credibility of the writers themselves, and external sh supporting historical material. John Warwick Montgomery, that was his approach to the three basic tests that uh, these things all pass. And, uh, and of course, archaeological confirmations are, are rampant for most of them. All of this is detailed in a briefing just on that subject, how we got our Bible. I encourage you, if you're to familiarize yourself with that background, we also summarize most of this in our Learn the Bible in 24 Hour uh, project. There's an interesting passage we also find of in Flavius Josephus. He was the Hebrew um, historian that was contemporary with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. He wrote The Wars of the Jews, which deals with that, but he also wrote a book called The Antiquities, where he summarizes Jewish history, most of its biblical history. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's interesting because he includes details that... Uh, that, uh, that uh, they understood at that time. But there's an interesting thing in Antiquities that he mentions in uh, 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 chapter 18, part 3. Now there was about this time Jesus a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross... He appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, etc. Now, as you can probably imagine, there are critics that say this obviously must have been added later. Josephus couldn't have written that, and so forth. But, uh, and I have no position to attack or, uh, or defend it, but that isn't Josephus. For those that want to check it out, I think it's pretty interesting. 
But this really focuses, the real issue is not Mary Magdalene, the real issue is not the Gnostic Gospels, the issue is Jesus Christ. And remember up at Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what do men say I am? No, what do you say I am? Who do you say uh, that I am? Now, is the whole thing a contrived story? People say, well, this is all a contrived story. You know, if it's a contrived story, he sure went out the hard way because his teachings contradicted the messianic expectation of the times. If he was trying to be the Messiah they expected, he did a lousy job. The Messiah he expected was so different than what they expected, they missed the point. That was not hardly the way to contrive a story. Official Jewry crucified him for blasphemy. He never said he was God. Really? Then why did they crucify him? That's what, that's what they crucified him for, claiming he was God. In John 8, he claimed to be the voice of the burning bush. He said, before Abraham was, I am, and so on. He, made, he, he clearly, he asserted that he was God, if you understand what he was saying. Um, see, declaring a man was God was against the bedrock of the Jewish faith. He wasn't playing a game here. He wasn't trying to conform to an expectation. Quite the contrary, he was going as far against their expectation as you could imagine. How can it be a contrived story? That's the, the unity of God and is, is, of course, expressed in Deuteronomy 6, the Jewish Shema. Here, Israel, Lord our God is one. The first commandment is, 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 uh, deals with this in Exodus 20, verse 3. He's violating all of those things if he isn't who he said he was. And by the way, that's, that's, that's another thing. It's commonly said. You've heard this before, but I, think I, I should work it in here. You, if you study Jesus Christ, you have to come to one of three conclusions. He either wasn't God and pretended he was. That makes him a liar. Can you, re, can you study his life and assume he was a liar? I don't think so. If he wasn't God and didn't know he wasn't God, then he's a lunatic. Or he was God and knew that he was. If that's in his Lord. So he's either a liar, a lunatic, or your Lord. You've got to pick one that you think fits the facts. But the other thing, the other testimony that goes against all this nonsense of the Dan Browns of this world is the testimony of the disciples' lives. These guys. Uniform, uniformly went to tortured deaths clinging to this wild tale. They never varied. They never broke. There wasn't one that sort of says, well, maybe, you know. No, quite the contrary. They didn't disappear. They vigorously spent their lives promoting the truth of Jesus Christ. And it was not generally accepted. It was met with persecutions that are legend. Thomas, Peter, etc., you know. Why Jesus? Why is he so important? Why is this such an issue? It's interesting that when Paul defines the gospel, he mentions that he died for our sins according to the scripture. That's 1 Corinthians 15, the first four verses. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You know what's fascinating when he defines the gospel? He does not mention his teachings. He doesn't mention his miracles. Why? There are many people who accept he's a great teacher. Many people even say, yeah, maybe he did some miracles. That's not the point. Why isn't the point? Because teachings and wonderful ideas cannot rescue a, burn, a person from a burning building. That's our predicament. We have need for salvation. And teachings and wonderful ideas and such are insufficient. It takes a person. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is the great divide between Christianity and Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Every cult finds some way to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. The incarnation is the great divide between Christianity and fill in the blank with any of these other things, but I'll use Gnosticism as the catch-all. It's also the divide between Christianity and Islam. Muhammad did not die for you. Muhammad was not sinless. Muhammad's sin had to be paid for, and he didn't pay for it. 
The incarnation is the great divide between Christianity and Islam. The most honest statement of our time is Osama bin Laden's. It's more honest than most of the pablum you hear on the 10 o'clock news. Why? Because Islam, Osama bin Laden said, this is a war between Christianity and Islam. And it is. You can't win a war if you don't know who the enemy is. By the way, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. It fulfilled all the specifications that God had laid down for the several thousand years prior. It was an achievement. And the resurrection was its validation. And try as Dan Brown and the others like him to hide that, confuse it, put it under carpet, it ain't going to work. Augustine had another interesting thing. He says, he who understands the holiness of God despairs in trying to appease him. To try to appease God is to not understand how holy he is. That's one of the many differences between the God of Abram, Isaac, and Yaakov, and Allah, and these are other imitations. Only God can meet his own requirements. In Christ, he did just that. So the whole issue, whether you're watching Mel Gibson's marvelous movie, The Passion, or whether you're reading the tripe of modern novelists, the issue is who is Jesus Christ really? That's the issue. There's only, Christ is the only way to God. The right way. Cain thought he could come to God his own way and on his own terms. It didn't work. God didn't accept that, and that's what caused him to murder his brother. You have to understand Genesis 4. And Jude nails that for you in Jude 1. Nadab and Abihu, Moses' nephews, they improvised what they thought was equivalent to what God wanted. And that didn't work either. God explained it a little more clearly to them, too. Christianity also stands in unbending opposition to any notion that salvation involves our own effort. That's the problem with the Da Vinci Code. That's the problem with all these books that would attack Jesus Christ. What's the alternative? What's their proposal to be reconciled to a holy God? They have none. And the great tragedy in our country is we have often promoted throughout our own culture a vacuous Christianity stripped of reality. We have a God without wrath that brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. That's rubbish in every particular. We do have a God whose justice will be vindicated. And there aren't men without sin. Every one of us have sinned. And we do have, we're going to have a kingdom that's going to have judgment. Praise God for that. And thank God that we have a Christ with a cro that went to the cross on our behalf. But we do have false teachers, and that's exactly what we've been hitting hit, head on here with this presentation. And Jude talks about that. He says, they feast with you, these false teachers, feeding themselves without fear. Boy, does that describe this guy. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. As I was really coming to grips with Dan Brown's tripe here, I had to throw that in. I, I'm stunned that a guy would go that crawl that aggressively dig himself a hole first law of holes is to stop digging right you know lenin claimed that under communism there would be bread in every household that was his promise but there's something he could never say that i am the bread of life and he that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst who said that not lenin jesus christ buddha taught enlightenment, yet died seeking more light. You know, it's interesting. No one dare criticize B Buddha for leaving his wife and kids to go meditate in the forest. But anyway, he taught enlightenment, yet he died seeking more light. He never said, I am the light of the world. 
He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus challenges you to try it. Prove it let him prove it to you. Sigmund Freud believed that psychotherapy would heal emotional and spiritual pains. But he, of course, <laughs> was an unsolved case himself. But he could never say, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's hardly what Freud could deal with. On the cover of our little presentation, it says, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. This whole issue really begs this issue of epistemology. You know, we often talk about hermeneutics, theory of interpretation. This goes deeper. Epistemology is a study of truth. It's nature or scope and limits. And uh, Pilate begged that question. What is truth? Very famous question. What is truth? How do we know anything is true? And uh, Jesus himself commanded you to be not, to, uh, be not deceived. Satan is out to deceive you. Satan is the ruler of this world, and his game is to deceive you. How are you going to prevent being deceived? You've got to do your homework. You don't, you don't indulge in blind faith. Faith in what? You need to know what you believe in and why you believe it, for your own sake. Plus, you can't be a witness unless you have done that homework. And that's why I think this, is, this, whole, this whole thing, the whole Da Vinci Code thing, is a call to homework. Not to read his book, but to really understand why we believe what we do. And Paul, you, you really got to recognize this is a blessing. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. And so that's what we should be doing. God is not on trial. You are. That's what it's all about. Now, there's a hidden code here that Dan Brown doesn't deal with directly, but he's part of a reversal of values. Mel Gibson did a movie, The Passion. He personally wrote the check, didn't need anybody else's help, did a marvelous job. And what's the reason? Of truth, taking the most true thing we know about and dramatize it on film so that we can relate to it. And it's called by Leon Wesselter, a repulsive masochistic fantasy, a sacred snuff film. Can you imagine in the New Republic? Courting bigotry in the name of sanctity, Marine Dow, the New York Times. You've got to be kidding. A real nutcase whose ulterior motive was making money, Andy Rooney in 60 Minutes. Man. Boy, if he makes a fortune, I understand he has, he deserves it. And not because of the topic, because he took the risks. He, he scratched where nobody else was itching. He deserves to win, by anyone's standards. They're just in adventure terms. The fact that God blessed him, that's another side of it. That's wonderful. He deserves it. Now, Dan Brown comes across with just the opposite. This is untrue, deliberate deceit. It's a compelling blend of history and page-turning suspense, according to the Library Journal. A masterpiece that should be mandatory reading. You've got to be kidding. By what standard? An exhaustively researched page-turner, according to Publishers Weekly. His research is shoddy. It's incorrect. It's faulty. It's deliberately twisted. He presents things that he knows are untrue to deliberately deceive his reader far beyond the needs of his plot line. Why is the passion excoriated and the Da Vinci Code extolled? There's a code you and I need to crack here. Why is this upside down thing going on? Why are Gibson's motives denounced and Brown's dignified? Gibson was trying to make money and Brown was trying to be self-sacrificed? You've got to be kidding. No, it's backwards. Why is Christ's passion regarded as repulsive masochistic fantasy and the supposed marriage with Mary Magdalene touted as researched material fact? There's no, not a scrap of, 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 of evidence in that. 
So this is all attacks from the pagan left. Who's the master conspirator? Not Dan Brown. Who's the master conspirator? Satan, Satan absolutely. There are others. This isn't the only ones. The Jesus Seminar, where subjective speculative hunches replace serious scholarship. You can get into biblical discussions where people disagree because they're both serious scholars looking at evidence. That's not the Jesus Seminar. You've got a bunch of guys sitting around making subjective speculative guesses as to what Jesus might have said. I'll vote on what I think he said. On what basis? On what basis? No basis. You talk about making a, a, a travesty of scholarship. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Peter Jennings TV special. Same kind of nonsense. Doesn't tell you about his wife being a Muslim. History Channel. Banned books of the Bible. Shoddy stuff. Shoddy stuff. By the way, even Mel Gibson's The Passion fails to identify who Jesus really is. And I'm not sure he can in a movie like that. I think it accomplished a very noble purpose. But still, there's limitations. And we could go back further and back. He was shown the Passover plot back in the 60s. And The uh, Last Temptation of Christ made it, uh, and on it goes. And uh, what's going on here? Is this simply political correctness in an increasingly secularist culture? It's certainly that. Maybe it's much more going on here. There is a reversal of values going among the illiterate. Fiction is cleverly peddled as if it were fact. This is regarded as, by, as fact by most of the readers. Fact, even the deity of Christ, is capriciously passed off as fiction. You see, there's a reversal here far deeper than may seem on the face of it. You and I are engaged in spiritual warfare. We need to understand that. It's going to be particularly visible in the coming months. We're in an election, in an election year. And we have deeply criminal elements manipulating everything they know how to gain power. This is unbridled crime. That's why Joe Farah of World Net Daily, in his monthly publication, has one titled The Party of Treason. And he's not talking about political differences of view that typically are between two political parties. He's talking about the vicious, bitter hatred and, and, and uh, um, chicanery going on. Of course, the ultimate conspirator for spiritual warfare is Satan himself. So we should recognize he is capable of great subtlety. We need to understand what he's up against. I mean, what we're up against. And uh, there is an ultimate code for you and I to unravel. Remember, Jesus warned us. You know, he gave a, when four disciples came to him for a confidential briefing of his second coming, he gave them a two-chapter answer. Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, 14, and Luke 21 and 22. So called, it happened to occur on the Mount of Olives. We call it the Olivet Discourse. But he opens and closes that prophetic briefing on his second coming with the admonition, be not deceived. That's the way he opens it, and that's the way he closes it. The challenge between, for, for you and I, spiritually, is probably the most important challenge we face in life, is not to be deceived. In fact, in verse 24 of Matthew 24, he even says, if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Wow. You can be deceived. The more certain you are that you can't be, probably the more vulnerable you are. You need to be doing your homework, and that's a continuous process. But let me shift gears. Let's talk about some, uh, something about the Merovingians that Dan Brown did not tell you. Let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the tribe of Dan. And I have to tell you, as I was doing more homework in this area, I was quite startled to realize there's aspects to the tribe of Dan that I had missed. I'll tell you why I had missed it. There is a the common folklore among pseudo-biblical types that there are ten lost tribes. And this all comes about because when, after Solomon dies, you've got the 
house of Israel split into two, the, the, uh, the Judah, house of Judah, I should say, in the south, and you had Jer in, under Rehoboam, and Jeroboam took the north, the house of Israel. Now, the, the southern is uh, uh, tribes are usually looked at as Simeon and Judah, and the northern tribes are the rest of them. So you got 12 minus, you know, two, you got 10, 10 tribes. Now, the northern, both go, go from bad to worse, but the northern goes bad consistently to the point where God wipes them out. Hosea is sent up there to point out why, and he does. And the Assyrians in 722 come in and destroy the northern kingdom, and they never again surface as a kingdom in history. And there, you have the ten lost tribes. And there's all kinds of quaint legends how they went out to populate Europe and so forth. And this leads to some views called British Israelism and so forth. And uh, frankly, I've always dismissed all that for several reasons. First of all, in the south, you've got Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon. That's three. So the most that can be lost, and by the way, the Levites also go down and join them. So that's four. So the most that can be lost are eight, not ten anyway. So the point is that it all falls apart if you start looking at your Bible. More importantly, in 2 Chronicles 11, it points out that during that tension, the Levites pick up and move south because they want to stay faithful to the temple worship, and up north they're going to, into idolatry. They don't want any part of that. So that makes sense. You can infer from that, too, that the faithful up north would migrate south to stay faithful to the temple worship. It doesn't say this, but you can also assume that people in the south that wanted to be idol worshippers, they'd go up where it's politically correct to be idol worshippers. The point is, people confuse the geographic designation of Ephraim or whatever, which are geographic designations from the time that land was assigned to those tribes back in the days of Joshua, with the genealogical links which get eroded by all this going on. Because when we get to the New Testament, there are people in the south from the tribe of Asher. Remember Anna who recognized Jesus? She's from the tribe of Asher. There are people from other tribes from the north in the south. They're not separated like people. And furthermore, um, James and Peter, they write their epistles to the 12 tribes, not to the 10 or the 2 or the whatever. So the whole 10 tribe myth is one that I've uh, studied enough to feel is just one of these myths that are, that are, that are non-biblical. And because of that focus, I've missed some interesting insights. Because the tribe of Dan is a particular problem. It apparently uh, has a history that I missed in terms of its geography. Um, and uh, this is going to be something we're going to want to look into. I'll show you why. You may recall that Jacob in Genesis 49 called all his tribes together, all his sons together, and prophesied over each one of them. And Dan gets, that's where we get, you know, the scepter shall not depart from Judah and so forth in verse 10. When you, get to, when you get to Dan, Jacob says a very strange prophecy. He says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Well, that's interesting. I don't know when Dan ever really judged his tribe. That's a, that's a small point there, but let's go on. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path, that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backward. This is one of these cryptic little riddles by Jacob talking about the tribe of Dan. Well, what did, uh, it's interesting that in the, in the wilderness wanderings, Dan was on the north side of the camp. And I think that's interesting because Satan aspires to be to the sides of the north in, in Isaiah 14. I'll let you play with that on your own. It's interesting, the head of that tribe, the tribe of Dan, at the time of the Exodus, was Ahazer. It's Numbers 1, 2, 10, 1 Chronicles 12, and so forth. He was the head of the tribe. What's interesting is that he um, does, he's not very happy with the serpent being there on their ensign because of Jacob's prophecy. So he understandably changes it to be an eagle because the eagle becomes the standard for the tribe of Dan subsequently. And uh, so we have a change in the imagery that represents the tribe of Dan. Okay, that's, that's understandable. We find evidence of that. In Unger's Bible Dictionary, it makes reference to that. Dan had the largest population of all the 12 tribes, but he gets the smallest allocation of land. In fact, he's supposed to, lay, to, to, to dwell west of Benjamin. But he doesn't cut it there. 
The Philistines are too strong. He doesn't make it. There's a whole tension continually. And Samson has, uh, has some uh, uh, incidents, but after he dies, they lose the territory altogether. They end up looking for someplace else to settle. So they don't settle west of Benjamin where they're supposed to. They settle way up north. Technically, it's in Naphtali's land, but it's un un unsettled. There's a place called Laish that they settle up in the north and call it Dan. And when you visit Israel, you can go up to Dan. That's where later on there's one of the, uh, one of the two golden calves put up there and so forth. When you get to Deuteronomy, just as Jacob prophesied over the tribes, there's a prophesy of, of, uh, of, uh, by Moses. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Now that's a pretty strange prophecy because when he said that, he's not living in the north yet. They live in the north later, but this predicts that he's going to leap from there. Bashan's up in the Golan Heights area. It's up in the upward Dan and all that is. So Dan is going to leap from there. And what's interesting about this is they... Uh, that uh, Joseph, Josephus in Antiquities mentions this, they migrate further north. They are lost long before the Assyrian invasion. When you get to 1 Chronicles, in the first eight chapters, it lists all the tribes. Dan ain't there. Interesting. He is missing long before Revelation 7. So, that leads the tri now that 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 leads to, that means there there may be it's possible that there are there the migrations of Dan up through Europe may have some validity, whether they have validity or not isn't important to us. People believe they do, and that's going to get very interesting. You see, the eagle replaced the serpent as a symbol of the tribe of Dan, but Samson's the key figure for the tribe of Dan, and Samson is identified. Through his riddle in Judges 14, remember he had, does that riddle with the Philistines about out of the eater shall come forth meat? Because he had this lion that he killed, and then he comes back later and discovers the lion's dead, but some bees had made a hive in, in his carcass. And he uses that to make this riddle, because out of the eater came forth meat. And the Philistines can't solve it except they get Delilah to comp comp get her, she, she finds out the answer, and there's the whole story. But the point is, that whole riddle, that makes, interestingly enough, apparently the bee becomes another symbol associated with the tribe of Dan. When they opened up the Merovingian tomb, they found 300 gold, little gold bees, as part of the treasure. And, that, and also the Merovingians were called the long-haired kings. So they, the Merovingian kings apparently identified themselves with the tribe of Dan. Again, Samson's the, the linkage here. And these gold bees are not just an incident. Napoleon takes them and makes sure when he's crowned emperor in France, he makes sure that his robe for the coronation has these 300 bees sewn in it. And when he marries Maria Louise Habsburg, which he does, she also has these 300 gold bees as part of her robe. So these things have a strange link. Now the Habsburg, of course, this all links back to the Merovingian line. And so, you know, here's the thing, it's also the Magdalen heresy we've been talking about, you and I disparage it. It may shock you to discover that it is accepted by the Mormon church. They think Jesus had several wives. But what's also interesting that the bee is the state symbol of Utah. Just thought I'd throw that out. I'd let you chew on that, see if that has some meaning to you. We're not through, it gets weirder as we go. Um, <laughs> You remember in Genesis 3.15, God pronounced war on Satan. He mentioned the seed of the woman, which of course is the title of Jesus Christ, and he spoke the seed of the serpent. There's a serpent seed also. It's interesting that genealogically, Antiochus Epiphanes, who's clearly a type of the Antichrist, may be a forebear to Titus Vespasian. When Titus Vespasian destroys the uh, temple in 70 AD, he may be a great-great-grandson of Antiochus Epiphanes who 
desecrated the temple back in 167 BC. That leads to Hanukkah and all that business. So there is a genealogical possibility that's link, that may link these. It may or may not be true, but people believe it's true. So it can impact future. That causes some people to expect that the coming world leader will be genealogically linked to these people, even though he's an Assyrian. Interesting stuff. And this all has an impact on the unification of Europe because the powerful families that are behind the unification of Europe, some of them hold the belief that they are in the Merovingian lineage. And uh, the, uh, so this, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 an agenda behind the scenes here. And this agenda, whether it's based on truth or not is important, may have a role in the final confrontations. As I say, Titus Vespasian may be a descendant of Antiochus IV. One of the things you begin to discover, see, you and I tend to assume that people who are into the occult are these fringe characters. And we sort of think mainstream, real world pragmatists aren't messing around with this stuff. No, we got it backwards. We need to understand that the lunatic fringe is not limited to the disenfranchised. There are very powerful people that are Satan worshipers. There are very powerful people that take the occult very seriously. And occultists have been behind much of modern history. You and I recognize that, uh, the, that the, the eagle is an ensign. It's interesting to realize that this eagle is a symbol of Israel's enemies, almost invariably. It's interesting to discover that the Spartans may have a link to the tribe of Dan. They may, may have been Jewish. Some of the, the first Maccabees, there's a number of, of, of uh, early records that tie the Spartans and the Trojans to possibly being uh, uh, of the tribes, which also leads to the Greeks, Antiochus Epiphanes maybe. The Romans were, were not Greek, but the Roman wealthy royal families intermarried with the Greek royal families. So there's a lot of genealogical linkages there. And the Romans had their eagles, Titus Vespasian and so forth. Herod had his eagle as a symbol. Byzantium and Russia both had the double eagle, looking east and west, was their symbols, still are today. The Franks and the Germans, and of course the British. We have all kinds of signs, whether it's the early Roman eagles, or whether it's the uh, uh, German uh, eagles, or the what have you. So. Um, so the role of the occult in modern history, you know, the Thule Society was a collection of occultists in Germany that became the Nazi party. And you need to understand, Hitler was preoccupied with the occult. He, he made a main point of getting Longinus' spear. That's the spear that purportedly was the one that pierced Jesus Christ. And when he lost it, he lost it. In other words, there's a whole history, a bizarre history of what's called the Spear of Destiny. And uh, Eisenhower, when they took over, made sure it was returned to the Habsburg Museum where it came from. The Ark of the Covenant. You know, we, there's a spoof, of course, in the, uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, but it really is just a spoof. But it, it's based on the fact that Hitler and Mussolini, they were serious about trying to chase down the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, uh, the Masters Treaty. I had an opportunity in 1993 to interview some 40 of the leadership in Europe, in some nine cities, uh, uh, just on the heels of the Masters Treaty being signed. And what fascinated me, I was traveling with uh, Admiral Bill Middendorf, uh, our amb ambassador to the European, uh, uh, in those days, yeah, European uh, community. And uh, it was interesting, in each country, the shenanigans and maneuvers to get the Master's Treaty finessed through the various approvals was each time different, but always well engineered by power groups in the, behind the scenes. It was very interesting. Well, let's talk, you say, gee, if, if, if the eagle turns out to be, uh, for whatever reason, the, a symbol of Israel's enemies, <laughs> what about the United States? Isn't the eagle our symbol too? Is it possible that this is... Uh, 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 somehow linked to the tribe of Dan? What about the back side of the great seal of the United States? Have you ever studied? You'd take a dollar bill sometime and take a good look at it. Let's see what's in here. 
If we take the Seal of the United States, of course, you've got the, 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 the eagle, and we've got 13 stars up top, and we've got 13 stripes on the shield, and we've got 13 arrows uh, in his left claw, if you will. Well, we say it belongs to the 13 colonies. Well, maybe it did and maybe it didn't. 13 is also a major Masonic number, some would maintain. Well, what about the e pluris unum? That means out of many, one. Oh, really? Is that a world dominion kind of thing, possibly, that we see on the thing? Okay. But here's the interesting thing. Count the feathers in the wings. In the right wing, we have 32 wing feathers, which are the, level, are the, uh, the levels of the Scottish Rite in masonry. In the left wing, we have 33, because there's the honorary one that's added. And uh, in the, uh, we then also have nine tail feathers, which seem to speak of the Council of Nine of the Illuminati. The Illuminati merged with the Masons on the 1st of May of 1776. Well, let's flip this thing over on the back side and see what it says there. That may be more revealing. First thing, notice, you can't help miss, is the all-seeing eye. See the all-seeing eye at the top of the pyramid? That's an Egyptian thing. It's called the open eye of Egypt. It's also called the symbol of Osiris. But it's also called the mind's eye among the Gnostics. It's full of this stuff. That's interesting. What's that doing on our dollar bill? And uh, I should mention, by the way, it's on dollar bill because Henry Wallace was very fascinated with the occult in 1935. He got FDR to put it on the dollar bill. But we also have this interesting thing here, anuit coeptis. What does that mean in Latin? Announcing the birth of. Announcing the birth of what? Well, by the way, just below that, uh, down here, we have 1776, which may, most people assume is the birth of our nation. That's fair, except it also is the birth of the Illuminati, incidentally, there at the bottom. But then announcing the birth of Novus Ordo Seclorum. Novus means new. Ordo means order. Seclorum is world or secular world. So this announces the birth of the new world order in the idiom of the Masons, if you will, or the Illuminati. That's kind of fun. Well, maybe there's more surprises here for us to be aware of. What if I told you that there was a 151-foot statue of Mary Magdalene, and uh, it is, she's wearing a toga and holding a grail as a torch in one of the major ports of the world sculptured by Auguste Bartholdi, and funded by the Freemasons of France, Freemasons of the Merovingian line. And there she is, a poem written by Emma Lazarus in 1883, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our seawash sunset, uh, sea sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Well, actually, I didn't think the Holy Grail was our lamp. I thought Jesus Christ was the light of the world. But in any case, uh, there we are with an interesting, what most people assume that was a gift to France. That's not quite true. Bartholi was trying to find a place to put this thing because his deal in Egypt fell apart. He got the guy to build the Eiffel Tower to join him, and they promoted this idea as a gift, not from France officially, but from private funding, most of which came from Freemasons of the Merovingians. On the U.S. side, they had a problem because he had to raise funds for a base. So they had a big fund drive to raise the money for the, fund, for the base that was funded by, uh, you know, soliciting donations, and they did, and, and uh, so there she stands. And indeed, has become a symbol of liberty to the world. I'm not here to knock it. Don't misunderstand me. But you sometimes wonder, is there something else behind the scenes? Is it possible that we are entering a period of time in which Satan... See, the, the scripture says that... God is going to send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, not a lie, the lie. Satan 
is going to hatch the most bizarre lie. And the world is going to buy it. And the world's going to buy it through ignorance. The world's going to buy it through deception. And all this stuff is going to tie together. And this leader that's going to come forth is going to be acceptable to the Catholics, to the Protestants, to the Muslims. All the world is going to embrace this coming world leader. So when you see deceit in all its forms, as you watch the campaign rhetoric during elections, watch the subtleties. Watch the subtleties and see where it's all headed. You and I are in spiritual warfare. And what's your remedy? Your remedy isn't trying to defeat the Diane Browns. Your remedy is Ephesians chapter 6. Paul lists seven elements of armor. And in the interest of keeping this reasonable length, I have not tried to go through and give you a little primer on the Ephesians 6, because I want you to do it yourself. In Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 10 following, Paul tells you, Put on the whole armor of God. He says it twice. He says it twice. And it's a command. He doesn't say put on your favorite pieces. He says put on your whole armor. Every, every one of them. You need to know what those seven pieces of armor... And by the way, the seven, not six. You first go through, you think there's six. The seventh one's the most important. You go through those, the, the, those uh, elements. Understand what they are. Do a study. Do it yourself. Dig it out. And many people figure that he's being chained to a, you know, a soldier while he's writing that. He may have been to keep the soldier from being able to get away. Um, but those idioms that he's drawing from are in the Old Testament in Isaiah and elsewhere. No, th that's the word of God. Those aren't just figures of speech. They have specific meaning. And you need to understand what they are. You need to equip yourself because you and I are heading... By the way, the other problem we've got is you don't put your armor on during the battle, you do it before the battle begins. We're already in the battle. We're on enemy turf right now. You and I need to review our equipment, understand it, we need to be trained with it. The one that we're all familiar with, the sword of the spirit, that's the word of God. Great, but you need to understand about swords. Swords, you know, the, the Roman sword, the, the, the conventional technology in those days was a long sword. I understand that because when I was at Naval Academy, I had to take boxing. I happen to hate boxing, but I had a long reach. That kept me out of some trouble. A long sword makes sense. It did to most people. Not to the Romans. They developed a 24-inch, 26-inch machaya. Very strange. And with it, they conquered the world. How? It takes two things you don't know about. Training, a lot of practice. Close in. They knew how to use it. Very, very, very different kind of fighting. But with that, they conquered the world. It also took a lot of practice. Same thing with your Bible. You need to understand how to use it, and you need to practice, 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 practice if you're going to fight this battle. Your shield of faith. Are there holes in your shield of faith? The Romans always, between battles, would plug the holes. Is there a hole in your shield of faith? There's something that bothers you you're not really sure about? Fix it now, or it's going to come back to haunt you. Do your homework. Dig in. Get, plug those holes. Understand why you believe. Understand what you believe important. Go through those and remember the seventh. You go through the whole list you get to the seventh one. That's your heavy artillery. That's your action at a distance. It's called prayer. That's called prayer. You can pray there. There are millions of Christians in the Sudan right now being persecuted. You can join them. You don't have to go there. You don't have to get buy a plane ticket. You can do it in your bedroom. Get on your knees. Pray for them. Most powerful thing. You have something even more powerful than the ballot box. And that's your prayer closet. And we're in an election year. Boy, every time I hear the news, I realize this country needs prayer. It needs a revival if it's going to survive. You've got more deceit flying around than you can even begin to catalog. Lies, deliberate lies, knowingly lies, frauds, crime. Uh, carrying, uh, anyway. Take it seriously. Dan Brown, yes, he did a real page-turner thriller, but man, at what a cost to so many people who, because of this, will doubt the Savior that died for them, will not, that will, that will uh, have something to overcome to get to the church and find out about the, the truth about these things. In every cultural war, truth is the first casualty. We need to understand that. That's two of ours, too. 
Well, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us the unspeakable privilege of having our personal copy of your supernatural word. We thank you, Father, that you have not only authored it, but that you've preserved it through the generations that we might savor its benefits. Father, we would ask through your Holy Spirit that you would increase in each of us a new hunger, a new passion for your word, that we might just bathe in it, that we might just grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Help us to, to really understand just who Jesus is. We thank you, Father, for going to such extremes for our benefit. We also come before your throne asking your forgiveness for our presumption and ingratitude and neglect of these incredible things you've provided for us. Help us, Father. Refresh us, Father. Strengthen us. Help us to get serious about our faith, Father. Help us to know how to contend for our faith, Father. We also pray for our country, Father. We do pray for the body of Christ in this country. We pray, Father, for your people who are called by your name, that we each might indeed humble ourselves and pray and seek your face with, and turn from our wicked ways, that we indeed, that our that you would hear our prayers, that you would forgive our sins, and that you would heal our land as we bring all this before you in the name and the authority of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.